We now welcome those who are coming into us on the video, whether it be YouTube, Facebook, or on the website itself, and uh, we're glad that you're here as well. A little bit um, of a wrinkle today and this morning in terms of order. Um, as, uh, you know, I, I, as I mentioned in the announcements, we had some fairly significant discussion at our, our last board meeting, and there appeared to be some signs of a little bit of political fatigue, you might say. So originally this date had been organized by a large consortium of churches evangelically across North America to perhaps preach on sexuality specifically as it pertains to Bill C-4 that has already passed our federal parliament. But I thought in some respects that I, that might just stoke the fatigue in some way. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to preach on the Sermon on the Mount, continue on from uh, the same chapter that we were beginning last week. But I want to be able to say this right. So I'm going to actually produce a pastoral statement about this particular organizational theme for the day. So if you will, I've written it out just so I can get it uh, in, a, you know, in a fairly concise manner here. Uh, Sunday, January 16th, 2022, marks the day set aside by a significant cross-section of the evangelical church in North America, with the unprecedented participation of about 3,000 American churches and ministries in support of the Canadian evangelical community. It is a work spearheaded by Canada's Liberty Coalition and others. This broad church support uh, south of the border, noted by our own denomination's national office, by the way, comes in response to the uncontested parliamentary passage of Canadian Bill C-4 into law, a law that will make possible the criminal conviction of Christian counselors and or pastors and others who are convicted of participating in so-called conversion therapy. Such therapy, as ill-defined as it is in the law that has passed, can even include those who simply express any one of a number of biblical injunctions against homosexual practice, or who even counsel a woman to remain a woman in keeping with Genesis 1.27. Criminal conviction under this new law carries a penalty of up to five years in Canadian prison. As pastor of Bay Community Church, I have already spoken about this legislation on multiple occasions this fall, and I have condemned it publicly. Despite all cultural trends that would attempt to justify everything from pornography to prostitution to abortion and homosexual acts, as well as transgender theory, I continue to believe that the sexual ethics and principles idealized within the Bible constitute God's superior plan for all people. And hence, I will continue to expound upon them freely, as long as I can, despite the menacing nature of this new law. For the present, nothing has changed. Bay Community Church will continue to welcome all sinners in need of Christ's forgiveness and the Father's loving grace, even if, if, even if by so doing we must inevitably take up a heavier cross and carry it in the process. Such are the times in which we find ourselves. As I have no intention of commenting further upon the politics of C4 today, I will end this pastoral statement with this observation about the potential of our situation. In 1955, there was indeed a smattering of people convicted of sodomy in Canadian prisons. But by 2025, there might be a smattering of people convicted of biblically disagreeing with homosexual acts in Canadian prisons. This means that the net result of 70 years of jurisprudence surrounding the sexual revolution means that our overall incarceration in Canada will have traded a biblical sex crime for an Orwellian thought crime. This is not progress. Thanks for hearing this statement. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray your mercy upon our country and upon our nation. We pray your mercy upon these words of Scripture that are coming, and uh, we pray too for the word of exposition that is in the sermon. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would always uphold your word and that you would grant your people courage in the midst of these days. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So I'm just going to invite uh, Michael Ford to read the word. Just two short readings this morning from Matthew. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those who find it are few. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs or from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, you will recognize them by their fruits. 2nd reading from John. Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Thanks be to God for the reading of his word. Thank you, Michael. Well, once again, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you, God, for your word that is given to us. I pray, O oh Lord, that this, uh, these words of interpretation might be fitting and true to your biblical witness. And we pray, O oh Lord, that your Holy Spirit's presence would be in the midst of us to build your people up, your church up in these days. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as some of you will know, I spent my junior and senior high school years in the West Coonies of British Columbia, living in Nelson at the time. Uh, that's where I first learned to drive badly. And uh, as anyone knows when you're a young driver, uh, there are places where you don't mind going, and there are places you much prefer to avoid. How many of you can remember those challenges when you were a young driver? I was no different. And there was, uh, I mean, I was looking at this in the broad sense of uh, actually even, not just streets and avenues, but also highways and things. And there was one main highway in the West Kootenays. And if you want to even call it a main highway, in a way it is, and in a way that's shocking. Uh, and I used to feel about this particular section of highway positively sorry uh, for any tourists who came especially those who approach from the south. Because when I was in high school and in early years of college, there was a place near Slocan City where there was a brand new, beautiful stretch of highway that took off and rose out of the town heading north towards uh, New Denver. 
It was truly beautifully reconstructed. Uh, it was a widened two-lane highway, and at that particular point as it climbed, it was a beautiful three-lane highway, just a joy to be on. But there was one small problem. It was almost like the provincial highway department had big plans, but then ran out of money, as sometimes happens. Because within less than a kilometer after this fantastic three-lane straight, uh, straight stretch climbing out of, uh, out of Slocan City, within a kilometer, it might have been less than that, in fact, could be in half that, the road promptly fizzled out into what I would describe would be a one-lane semi-asphalt driveway with turnouts. Staring straight down at Slocan Lake, 1,000 to 1,500 feet below. Okay? You picturing this? You know, Dennett, don't even get me going as to what this stretch of highway would have been like at night in a snowstorm. Thankfully, that's not usually tourist season. Now, it is true that it could be a beautiful in its own way. You know, standing at those turnouts in the spring, for example, the, the high spring, one could look down upon the lake below, far below, I might add, and see those kind of wondrous swirling patterns of pollen as it had come off the trees. And they were usually like bright, bright yellow. So on the, on the surface of the lake, it was almost like a Monet canvas at times. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. But like I say, you know, I, I would stare over that and look down. And I don't know about you, but do you ever get pains in the back of your leg when you look far, far down at something? I don't know what it is, but my muscles seize up in my legs. And it's like, almost like my knees are going, well, we could jump, but I, I don't think whether we could quite take it, you know, that type of thing. And uh, such is the case when you look down from this height, you'd get that pain in your legs, or at least I would. <laughs> anyway, one just shuddered, like I say, uh, at the idea of how close the traffic was to joining the Apollo. Like I say, it was both beautiful and dangerous as a road. On the whole, though, I did not like driving it. And when I came from the other direction, from the north, coming from New Denver, and watched on that stretch of highway that was so brand new, some big Winnebago climb up that beautiful three-lane hill, I remember thinking, that guy has absolutely no idea what he is about to face. <laughs> Most likely, if he was a tourist at least. So all that is to say, the truth be told, folks, I absolutely preferred myself the wide and easy way. And you know what? I don't think that much has changed since Jesus' day in that sense. You know, when I imagine the, the, the walking trails and the pathways, because that's probably what we would call them today, of, of Galilee and of ancient Judea, I rather suspect that some local travelers in Jesus' day really appreciated the relative ease and speed of a Roman street or a Roman road, given the rustic nature of the alternative that existed in the empire. But here we are, in the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus says something every bit as surprising, probably to his first listeners, as to today's. Enter by the narrow gate, or the narrow door. For the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many. Now, for those who like exploring original biblical language, you should know this. It's quite fascinating. The easy terminology that the uh, ESV, the English Standard Version, picks up in the Bible is actually here more implicit than explicit. In fact, you won't find the word easy in the original Greek at all in this situation. So why did they do it? Well, it's actually responsible enough because the actual phrase, the way is broad, contained that kind of nuance, first of all. But that nuance is also driven home in the following verse. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life and those who find it are few, it says in Matthew 7, 14. 
Now, if you were to take the Greek on, in that particular verse, it would, you could easily translate it this way. For, the, for narrow is the gate, and compressed is the way. Which is kind of an unusual, I mean, we probably don't find that because it probably wouldn't make sense to a lot of people if we wrote it that way, but it could be written that way with some degree of integrity, I might add. Because the Greek root word producing the word compressed, in this case, phlebo, kind of difficult to say, but that's the word, phlebo. It means not only narrow, but it also, has, it also means narrow by being constricted. Narrow by being compressed, as in pushed together. And the term, like I say, it contains nuances of both affliction, affliction, and even persecution. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. Hence, verse 14 shows us in a way why the word easy is sometimes utilized in biblical translations there. Because it's not just that the way is wide, it's that it's also untroubled by trial and free from various pressures, unlike the narrow way. So in very real terms, when we have the actual expression in the English language that says, you've reached easy street, it's, very, it's a very similar understanding, in a way. It's easy street, folks. The only problem is that the narrow street is leading to uh, better things, and that the easy street, if you will, is actually heading inevitably to a cliff and to a pit that nobody wants to go in. For the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, to perdition, to damnation. Now remember, this is Jesus' major speech in this gospel. And we're told by Matthew that crowds of people are listening to him at this point. But you can clearly see, I hope, that Jesus is not schmoozing just because there's a big crowd. He's not designing his words in order to curry favor. He's not speaking in order to scratch any itching ear, as we might pull a different biblical metaphor and attach it here. If this is about, you might say in a modern sense, church growth, it's a most unusual strategy. Wouldn't you say? It, you know, it, it's like this. It's like Jesus was saying this. Hi, follow me, Jesus, and it will cost you. It won't be easy. It will be difficult. You'll be under distressing and suffocating pressure at times, but I promise you, it will lead you to life. Now, who's with me? You see, in a way that... Uh, that Jesus wasn't simply somebody you know, stoking some kind of populist flame. Because his very words mitigated against following him. It's almost as though Jesus is saying, you know, by all means follow me, but understand it's not going to be easy. Have the maturity to understand it's not going to be easy. But it does lead to life. Eternal life. You know, had Jesus done his uh, Sermon on the Mount in the Kootenays, at a certain point in my life, I might have asked him, Lord, have you seen that scary road to New Denver? Sure, it's narrow, but ugh. But I think Jesus knows the human preference we have, all of us have, for the wide, the gentle, and the well-marked way. This is why he deliberately highlights the narrow, I suspect. You know, after all, anyone can drive on a broad, gentle, and easy way, but can anyone drive on a one lane with turnouts 1,500 feet above the lake in a snowstorm way? The narrow way is different. It is. It's slower. It's more stressful. It's more challenging and difficult. And it may even lead to greater anxiety and more pressure-packed decision-making, and it can even be dangerous. 
Jesus wasn't, you know, blowing sunshine up our nose. If you will. But here's the thing about the narrow way. You won't like it, perhaps, but you'll grow. You'll grow. And the path will lead to life. First to your maturity, and then to life. In such comparisons and passages, too, we can also glimpse, I think, the absolute need that we have to this day for courage. We have an absolute need for courage. Christians must be brave. In following Jesus, disciples were taking up this challenge. They were saying to the Lord, yes, we get it, but we still want it. The way may be, the narrow way may be hard, it may be dangerous, it may be pressure packed, but we also believe that eternal life is what we want. And we also believe that the ways of God are such that we're prepared to endure such things for the sake of that goal. And you know, speaking more locally, you know, I compare the narrow way at times to, to looking at the trees at Lazo Point down this way. How many of you have ever looked at the trees of Lazo Point? <laughs> Just that many, come on! <laughs> I don't believe that, it's gotta be more. Got to be more. You know, we, we all know that the trees of Lazo Point are not the trees of a sheltered glade, are they? They're exposed. They're so exposed, in fact, to the harsh elements that they're not even remotely symmetrical anymore. They've been pounded by so many winter storms and winds that you can tell how the dominant wind blows just by looking at their limbs. Make no mistake, they've been under serious pressure since they were seedlings. But isn't it interesting when you consider the visual arts, just how many artists like Canada's Group of Seven make the character of the wind-blown tree the story of their canvas. On some, in some way, they have a beauty all their own. You, you almost want to stand there transfixed and just look at it. It's not like a Christmas tree, that's true, but it doesn't matter. There's a, a beauty there that you can perceive in the midst of the harshness of the elements, and yet here stands the tree defiantly saying, I'm going to be here. I'm attached to the rock, and I'm not going to move. In a way, the aerodynamic pressures that literally threaten the life of those trees are the very things that give those trees great character as the years progress. Even so, for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard. It leads to life. Likewise, any Winnebago driver that could negotiate that narrow way north of Slocan City was likely a better and more experienced driver for it. Speaking of trees, as we move into the next section in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, Jesus uses them, not just roads and pathways, to make a point. And I wanted to shift gears, pardon the pun, and speak to this next passage in the Sermon on the Mount in that sense. It will, I think, perhaps confirm what I spoke about last week, about the culture's propensity to misunderstand what Jesus meant about, about judging. You know, in the, in the rurals of Saskatchewan in my early days in ministry, I met a friend who was a transplanted Australian pastor. His name was Phil, and he's now back there down under. And in one of those curious moments of conversation that the Holy Spirit doesn't allow one to forget, he said something that was an interesting metaphor to me. And I've never forgotten it. When we got on the topic of biblical judgment and condemnation, 
He looked at me and he, and he said to me, the Lord has certainly made me a fruit inspector. We are indeed fruit inspectors, all of us. And at that point, my friend was referencing the Sermon on the Mount, of course. It is curious that not long after, Jesus talks about applying the same standards of judgment to oneself as one would do to others. Uh, you know, the image of the logs and the specks that we talked about last week. Reminding his listeners that one always must stand under and, and be accountable to the standards that one pronounces from their mouth. That he also spoke about trees and fruit and inspection. He spoke about being able to judge between good and evil. So as I was saying last week, just, just, you know, the cultural understanding of judge not is so appallingly off base from where the New Testament is, it needs to be reiterated again and again. Because it's not about standing to be, it's not about becoming, as I was mentioning last week, being morally mute in the midst of the cultural tides. Because our entire Mature, maturation, you could say, is about being able to better judge between good and evil. Becoming a better judge. And then Jesus, of course, says this, are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit, but the diseased tree bears bad fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So when Jesus says you will recognize them, he is calling his disciples, calling us to be fruit inspectors. Judges. We must be able to discern between the healthy tree and the diseased tree. And the key to doing that, Jesus says, is to examine what comes forth from that tree. It's diseased fruit or good fruit. And you know, do we need to say this? Maybe we always do, just to remind folks. This isn't really about trees, is it? <laughs> Can I state the obvious? This isn't about trees. <laughs> it's about humans. Jesus also warns us by another metaphor that what we first see isn't what we inevitably get. You know, in one of history's most enduring metaphors, Jesus may have been referencing the well-known by that point 500-year-old Aesop's fable when he said, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. This is so powerful an image, in fact, that the metaphor of, or the phrase, wolves in sheep's clothing, of course, long ago entered the English vernacular, probably aided by a Bible that could be read in the vernacular. Throw that in just as another way of upholding, I think, the importance of what some of the early reformers insisted upon, getting a Bible into the hands of everyone who could read and read it in their own language. Hallelujah. Which is what the Windsors up north are doing. Hallelujah to this day. Be that as it may, do you see the interesting connection? You know, one cannot know who precisely is a wolf in sheep's clothing without watching and at some point making an actual judgment call. Once again, our culture's complaint of don't judge me is not the biblical standard, as we talked about last week. Proper maturity in the Christian faith will require us to properly discern between good and evil to be sheep inspectors and fruit inspectors. But as Jesus would remind us, work on your own eyes first. Ask for the Holy Spirit's help to discern. And you will eventually be able to see clearly 
to remove the sins that impact you that are keeping your development in Christ down so that you can move further ahead, further towards maturity in Christ Jesus. And in the midst of all that, understand that there are dangers along the narrow way. All roads contain two ditches, even the road of judgment, you could say, as I have mentioned in previous sermons in the last few years. In discerning your world and inspecting it, the danger on your left might be you could become judgmental in the worst sense of that word. The danger on your right will be you could also become permissive in the worst sense of that word. Do you see the dangers that are on the narrow way? If you're being grown into the understanding of judgment, you, you're going to make mistakes. But as you, as you cling to the Word, the Word is going to help guide you along the narrow path so you don't make a mistake of the ditch on the left or the ditch on the right. In this case, you'll be able to navigate between an undue judgmentalism and an undue permissivism where you don't care anymore or anyone, what anyone does. It's not your fault. There are equal dangers to the left and to the right. And honestly, I can simply say to the body of Christ, mind the dangers that are inherent in the narrow way in walking along what can be like a knife's edge publicly. Yet, in choosing the narrow way, Praise the Lord that you learn, because you will learn. You will learn far more, in fact, than if everything had been given to you on a silver platter, or had you been walking on an easy, gentle, and wide avenue. But let us make no mistake. The narrow walk behind our Lord is going to be in each and every generation difficult, pressure filled, a trial, and even dangerous. But we, like the first disciples, must find our courage and pray for it. But of course, not in that order. <laughs> Because I think the mature eventually realize that it is the narrow road that leads first to our character development in Christ and then ultimately to life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks, O Lord, that you have called us out of darkness and into light. And you've called us to walk along a path, a path that is narrow. And Lord, you've called us to be discerning, to be of good character in our judgments, to understand and grow in your way, and to be the disciples that take on the self-discipline of following you. Father, we know the narrow, road, narrow way is fraught with its own challenges. And as we even see things, O oh Lord, in the natural, we know that the narrow way is sometimes obviously dangerous. Where one stares down at lakes a thousand feet below. Where one wonders where one would be in a fog or in a bad storm. But Father, the narrow way is where we learn to walk and drive carefully. It's where we mature. It's where we understand the grace of God. It's where we understand the deliverance of God. It's where we understand courage. It's where we're given courage. So Father, help us even to this generation to be a church that is actually praying for courage, praying for boldness in these days, praying to be able to face the winds of culture that we're facing, praying in so many different ways, O oh Lord, to be strengthened, even by the discipline of your own hand along the narrow way. And we pray all these things 
In Jesus' name.